Hi everybody, this is an intro to the Quantopian lecture series. So if you're already familiar with Quantopian and with the lecture series, please feel free to skip ahead. Quantopian is a crowdsourced investment firm. And our goal is to democratize quantitative finance and to level Wall Street's playing field by providing a lot of free tools and data of the same caliber that you would run into as a professional on Wall Street. Our business model is to provide capital allocations to the best algorithms that are developed on the platform. To this end, we've developed a pretty extensive educational curriculum to make sure that our users are well educated. The Quantopian lectures are developed in conjunction with and are used for teaching by professors at top universities all around the world. We also work with industry practitioners to make sure that all the examples that we teach are current and up to date with techniques that are actually being practiced in the field today. In general, we try to teach theory and intuition hand in hand so that once you've learned a concept, you have readily accessible code snippets to then go out and apply it. Let's get right into it then and see what we're getting into today. So today we're going to talk about a few of the things you need to consider whenever you're trading futures, either in the wild or on the Quantopian platform. It probably makes the most sense to discuss what makes futures weird in the context of how they differ from equities, right? Everybody has a basic understanding of equities in some way or another, and it's just the most common financial instrument that anyone in the wild would trade, right? So compared to equities, futures have a very different calendar. Their markets are open way after the equity markets close, but the actual times where you can depend on your orders getting executed mostly overlap with the equities markets. Like there is some overnight trading for given futures contracts, but it's very, very small. So at least on the Quantopian platform, we've restricted, we've kind of contracted the hours that you can trade futures to the most liquid hours. Though you can get the data for all hours of futures trading for every contract. So let's just compare this S&P 500 index E-mini futures contract deliverable in March 2017. And let's, let's have a look at how this volume is broken out, right? Like this is the volume for a given day, March 1st, broken out by every individual minute. And we see that the grand bulk of the volume here is between 9.30 and this looks to be around 4.30, 5 o'clock. I, I, I can't quite put my finger on it, but that general range here. Like there's this massive spike in volume here while overnight there's very, very little comparatively. So it makes sense to just restrict to this main volume area here. The thing is, this is going to be different from futures contract to futures contract. This is the S&P 500 E-mini contract. This is a financial future equivalent to about 50 units of the S&P 500 index. As a financial future, since it's based on a financial instrument, it's not really based on a concrete good in the same way that a commodity future is, it's much more liquid. Right? Commodity futures, since they have an actual physical deliverable thing, fewer people tend to trade them. Financial futures are usually settled in cash, so you don't need to actually deliver shares of the S&P 500 index. You just need to deliver the cash difference, which makes it a lot simpler to deliver for these. If we look at, well, feeder cattle, deliverable again in March 2017. We'll get it over about the same period of time. And we see, all right, well, this is significantly more constricted, right? We only have a maximum of around 350 contracts being traded, whereas at the peak, the S&P 500 index E-mini is at around 35,000 contracts traded. And it, again, there's essentially zero volume outside of the hours of 9.30 and around 2.30 p.m., or is that 3? I'm not quite sure, but this is significantly contracted trading hours with significantly reduced volume across those hours. And keep in mind, at the point in time at which we're looking at these contracts, these are the front month. These are the next deliverable contracts. And with futures, the next deliverable contract, the front month contract, is the most liquid, almost unilaterally across all futures contracts. There are a few quirks here and there, but generally this is going to be the most liquid that this contract will be, whatever the next deliverable one is. So whenever we're trading multiple different futures in the same algorithm, well, we need to be aware of this, right? A massive bottleneck for any sort of trading strategy or any sort of algorithm 
is liquidity, is the ability to actually execute on the trades that your model wants to make. Because your model statistically calculates the moves that it wants to make, right, according to its mandate. And if you can't actually execute on those trades due to liquidity constraints, then you're essentially violating the assumptions of the model. So you have no real reason to believe that it's going to work in the first place or continue to work if you don't have a properly liquid environment for the algorithm to work within. So this is also a concern when we're considering different expiries on the same exact underlying asset, right? If we take the S&P 500 index E-mini contract again, and we look at it deliverable in March, June, and September, let's pull the volume for this, right? And have a look at how this changes. While this March contract is the front month, there is essentially zero volume for these other contracts deliverable in the same exact year, right? And this is a concern because, well, what if I want to trade not the front month contract, right? What if I found some signal on even the next deliverable contract in this case? Let's say that I have some signal that I found on the June deliverable contract. If I'm here in time and I can't actually execute this, then well, I'm not going to be able to make any trades. I'm not going to make any sort of profit, right? which is really just unfortunate because, you know, whenever there's a lack of liquidity, that there is going to be some sort of inefficiency there. Wherever there's a lack of liquidity, there's going to be an inefficiency. And a lot of quant trading, a lot of algorithmic trading is based on finding an, an inefficiency and trading it. But if we can't trade it, then we can't get the inefficiency and we can't really get any alpha there, which is just this big unfortunate paradox. So another thing to consider on futures contracts is that futures positions have this inherent leverage, right? You're not paying for the full value of the contract. You're paying some percentage of the value whenever you open up a position. What you do when you open up a futures position is you essentially expose this margin account to the fluctuations in the futures price deliverable at a certain day. You maintain the margin in the account by essentially maintaining a certain percentage of the overall value of the contracts. Like as long as you're above that percentage value, then you're fine and you can keep the futures position open. So the way that we actually determine, uh, the, or the way that a, a broker actually determines the amount of leverage that's appropriate for a given future is based on a bunch of different things. But that's not something that we're really looking at in the first place, right? When you open up a futures position at one price and close it at another price, that difference is going to be the profit that you make per unit futures contract that you have. Just know that if you're trying to come up with a reasonable notion of how levered your portfolio is overall, if you're incorporating futures and other financial in instruments at the same time, that there is this inherent leverage in a futures position, right? And that's something to remember. Another major issue with futures contracts is, well, they expire, right? So a very common thing that people do whenever they hold a futures vision is that they roll over the futures contract. Seldomly do people actually take delivery for a given futures contract, right? Seldom are, is the futures contract actually executed upon. What people usually do is they roll it over. They close the old position in whatever month contract, however months out from the front month they had it open in, and they just open up the next position as appropriate in the series of time. So if I'm just trading the front month, that would be I'd close the front month at some point before its expiry and open up the next deliverable month's contract in order to maintain whatever hedge or whatever position I have. Because, well, you use futures contracts for a bunch of different stuff, right? If I'm using futures contracts for hedging, well, I probably don't want my hedge to expire. I might want to adjust my hedge and what proportion of, of different futures contracts that I'm holding in order to better remove my risk at a given point in time. But I don't want that hedge to expire. I want to maintain that across time. So I'm going to close out my old positions and open up new positions each time. If people didn't roll over in the first place, then well, we have to develop stuff on a very short time scale just due to the limited nature of each individual futures contract. And what's interesting is that when we look at futures contracts, right, when we look at the change between different futures contracts, we see this sort of 
crossover. As we approach the expiry, uh, this is the uh, the same contracts from up above, the March, June, and September deliverable S&P 500 index E-mini contracts. As this March contract approaches expiry in March, we see that its volume drops as people close out those positions and roll them into these June positions instead. So if we take this sort of skyline here, this black dotted line, this is the volume that we would enjoy by closing out our front month contract and moving our position to the next month as we approach the expiry of each. Essentially what we're doing here is we're riding this wave of liquidity provided by the front month. But this same sort of behavior is going to hold no matter how many months out you're actually trading. If you're holding a position that's two months out on a given underlying, well, as you approach the expiry of the front month, you might want to roll that forward again. It really depends on how your strategy is constructed, right? If your strategy relies on being n months out from the front month, you want to remain n months out from the front month. So here at Quantopian, we put together this API construct called a continuous future. And the idea behind a continuous future and the problem that it's trying to solve is that it's very difficult to get a continuous series of historical futures prices for a given underlying, right? Each time that you roll forward a contract, what you're doing is you're closing the old position and then you're opening up a new one. There's going to be this gap from the price that you close at and the price that you open at for the new position. And every single time we roll over, we get this jump. And this can negatively impact any sort of analysis of prices that we're trying to deal with, right? Because if you're looking at the return stream over this historical price series, then you're going to see these big jumps, either positively or negatively. It doesn't really matter whether it's a positive or a negative jump. The issue is that these shocks are going to really mess up any sort of return and volatility measures that we have. Like it might not actually be representative of the true changes in the underlying price. It's just us eating or gaining this cost of carry from moving over to the next contract. So the idea behind a continuous futures object is to kind of abstract this away, right? So we specify an underlying that we want to track. We look at the offset from the front month. So in this case, if we're saying an offset of zero, that means we always want to be looking at the front month of this corn contract. With an offset of one, then we'd be looking at one month out or one contract out from the front month. And with an offset of two, we'd be looking at two contracts out from the front month and so on and so forth. So this role parameter indicates how we want the continuous future to start looking at the next contract. So what calendar says is that at the same date each month, start looking at the next in the chain. And our other option is volume. So when the volume of the next month eclipses this month, that's when we roll over. That's when it starts pointing at the next contract in the chain. It's, a, it's important to specify that this does not actually roll over a contract for you if you're trading it in the back tester or if you're doing any sort of research on it. All that the continuous future does is point at the appropriate contract. And it is then up to you to get what that appropriate contract is and order it and close out the old position. Or you would just let it auto close. What this adjustment here does is it allows us to historically adjust everything before our reference point. So our options for adjustment are either multiplicative, additive, or none. And these are important because these help close that gap. Basically, what we say is, as of today, I want to close all these previous gaps. So we scale up the first gap, and then we use that multiplier to scale up the next gap out in the past, and so on and so forth, aggregating up. So this multiplicative thing, what this does is it adjusts these gaps with a ratio. And what additive does is it adjusts them with a flat amount. It just adds it onto the old prices. So what these adjustments do is they basically truncate this cost of carry. They include the cost of carry in the past as of today so that we can have this continuous price series with no jumps. 
we need these adjustments in some way or another in order to frame past prices relative to today's prices. And it's neither here nor there whether you want to do a multiplicative adjustment or an additive adjustment or even if you just want to have no adjustment at all. But the general consensus in the wild is that some sort of adjustment needs to be made. For some underlyings, people prefer a multiplicative adjustment, and for other underlyings, people prefer an additive adjustment. But generally, people want an adjustment. So let's say that we take this continuous corn object that we defined above, and we'll just call this history function on it to get this continuous front month corn price from 2009 to 2016. And if we plot that, we see that we get this nice continuous series overall. If we didn't have this adjustment, then we would see kind of gaps in these prices, which would mess everything up. So the main reason we really care about these adjustments, besides taking the volatility and besides taking the mean and everything, is if we have some sort of statistical test that we want to perform. If we're building any sort of statistical models, we want everything to be continuous. We don't want any sort of discontinuities because we want to be able to conduct some sort of meaningful statistical analysis, right? Continuous futures are important for understanding how futures prices evolve over time. And since a lot of our alpha is going to be based on how futures prices evolve over, evolve over time and how futures prices evolve over time relative to each other, it's important to have that firm basis. The final real thing to consider here whenever we're talking about futures contracts is that there are significantly fewer assets in space, I'll call it, right? On Quantopian, we have around 72 underlying contracts that we can trade. The thing is, we have this depth of time that's available with futures, right? We can trade something deliverable this month or next month or the month after that, all at the same time on the same underlying. So in space, we may not have as many futures contracts. We, not, we may not have as many underlyings as the US equities market, but adding this time component where we can essentially make hedges on the term structure, on the time structure of how a futures price evolves throughout its history, this gives us a lot more versatility. And this is why we're concerned about liquidity, right? Because, well, if there's alpha to be found time-wise, then we want to make sure that we can actually trade it. We want to make sure that even if we find some interesting signal, that it is actually viable if we go to trade it in the open market. This has been the lecture on futures trading considerations. And thank you very much for listening. Hi, everybody. Thank you for watching the Quantopian Lecture Series. If you have a desire to see any more of our content, it is all available at www.quantopian.com lectures. If you're already on the Quantopian site, you can also get to this page by going over to Learn and Support, clicking on Learn, and then this lectures link will bring you right back here. All of these lectures have a notebook associated with them, which contains the theory and applications for the lecture. It's the real meat. Many of these lectures will also have a video associated with them that you can watch, just like the one that you just watched. And then some of these lectures are going to have algorithms that you can clone and iterate on just to give you a basis to start with your own algorithmic trading ideas. We also have a GitHub, which is at github.com slash quantopian slash research underscore public. All the stuff that's on our lectures page is also here if you dig around. You can also follow me on Twitter at clean underscore utensils. And we also have, last but not least, uh, some resources available for any sort of academics who want to incorporate the lecture series into their classes. All of this stuff is free. We just like to provide a little bit more guidance for professors who want to get Quantopian involved with how they teach. Lastly, you can email me at max at quantopian.com, and that's just M-A-X at quantopian.com. Feel free to send me any sort of feedback, any sort of questions you have about the lecture series. We're always looking to improve things, so we always want to hear comments about how we can make it better. Thank you so much.